All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for being here, everyone who's been here all day. An extra thank you to you guys. Hello to all of our friends on Twitch. And it has been a great day here for Borderlands 3. Lots and lots of panels. Make sure to come back for the 3.30. We will have all six grads here. But right now, I want to give a big round of applause during a presentation on art creation pipelines for huge games. Big round of applause for Jacob Christopher, everybody. Uh, no. Uh, all right, so I'm going to talk about Borderlands 3 today. And unfortunately, my notes for each slide seem to be uh, invisible. Um, so I'm going to do this uh, the best I can. So this talk is going to explain uh, some of the art creation process for BL3, um, what it was like being a lead uh, on that project. Uh, and we'll also talk a little bit about um, uh, what it takes to get a job as a content artist. Okay, so first of all, um, I do have to give a shout out to the uh, entire development team that worked on BL3. Uh, a lot of people worked very hard on it. Um, and I have to give a special shout out to all the artists uh, that worked on it. This is um, a compilation of a bunch of content art that was made for the game. Uh, and as you can see, um, everyone on the team signed it. Okay, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I graduated from Full Sail in 2009 with a Bachelor of Science in Computer Animation. Uh, for a bit of perspective, <laughs> Unreal 3 was brand new. Uh, Perpixel Lighting was kind of a new thing. Uh, there wasn't Substance Painter or Designer. Um, there was a lot of new stuff uh, at the time. Um, then, uh, after graduation, I was hired full-time uh, at Gearbox Software in 2010. Um, and then I was promoted to content art lead in 2015. Um, so let's take a quick look at the art team at Gearbox. Um, the team is actually pretty large. It's split up into a few specialties. Uh, first of all, there's concept art that uh, uh, provides art direction and uh, visualization for uh, other artists. There's the environment team, which consists of level art, uh, lighting, and content art. And then there's the character artists that, of course, deal with uh, player characters, non-player characters, enemies, bosses, stuff like that. Uh, weapons team, they made the system uh, and, of course, the art for all 70 bajillion guns. Uh, and then vehicle team that, of course, did drivable vehicles. Uh, so what exactly is content art? Well, we make the assets that build uh, all the maps. Uh, so we make stuff like architecture, props, uh, biomes, and interactive objects. These things specifically are uh, architecture here, which uh, builds interior spaces and exterior facades. Uh, there's some stuff from the Anvil Prison, the um, uh, Meridian uh, City, and some stuff from Eden 6. You got your biome, which is plants, trees, foliage, terrain, uh, rocks, skybox, stuff like that. Uh, props, which help add flavor to environments. Uh, and interactive objects, which are specific assets that a player might interact with, uh, pick up, use, um, otherwise things that aren't uh, just static assets. And a pickle. Uh, this was a very special asset. Um, you'll just have to guess where we used it. <clears throat> Um, so, brief history of art A Gearbox. Um, so, in 2010, I was brought on to work in Brothers in Arms. Uh, the art team was around 15 people. I think the studio was a little over 100. Um, that project was canceled, and we moved to, uh, the art team uh, moved to another project, which was Borderlands 2. Um, the art team for that was maybe about 25 people, and I think at the time the studio was around 180. Uh, Battleborn was uh, another project. 
Um, the art team at the time was split among a couple projects, so there were only about 15 artists uh, dedicated to it. And during this time, we started a uh, sibling studio in Quebec. Uh, and the studio continued to grow and expand uh, so we could all work on this game. Um, so now we'll go into uh, a little bit about the project, uh, the artwork, um, and some of the changes uh, that went on in the studio during this time. Uh, but first, we're going to start with the tech, uh, because I think it's very important to understand the constraints that uh, we're working under. Um, I think any profession will usually have standards, practices, uh, budgets and such that all need to be ad adhered to. Uh, so understanding what you're working with, uh, what constraints you're under is, is rather important. Okay, so compared to uh, uh, previous Borderlands titles, um, uh, BL3 is actually, uh, actually uses Unreal 4. Past um, titles were on uh, Unreal 3 and, of course, PlayStation 3. Um, so this is a new generation of hardware for us. Uh, memory increased about tenfold over previous projects. Uh, the CPU and GPU are much faster. Uh, triangle count, texture size, shader complexity uh, could all be uh, much greater. Um, and uh, because of all this, improvements in graphics and the gaming experience were uh, a lot better. Um, so this is a screenshot from BL3. Uh, as you can see, there's, uh, it definitely has lighting. It has some materials. It has textures, obviously. Uh, but let's take a look at a shot of BL2. Um, as you can see, uh, textures are a little bit low, uh, lower resolution. Uh, there's much less detail in, in the geometry. Um, value ranges are uh, a little bit pushed to the, to the extremes. Um, there's some stuff that's uh, pure black. Some stuff is a little bit over bright. Uh, but because of Unreal 4, uh, we were able to uh, have, we, we basically had much more uh, graphics horsepower at our disposal, uh, and we could do some really cool things. Our scenes could be much more intricate. Everything could have much more detail. Uh, this shot right here is just um, from the skybox of Meridian City. Here's another one from BL2. And once again, if you look closely, um, you can still see where a few things, um, uh, you can see where the technological limitations were. Because um, once again, sil silhouettes were a little bit blocky. Um, textures were just a little bit uh, low res and pixelated at times. Uh, but once again, uh, stuff has improved immensely. Okay, so let's talk uh, improvements uh, with Unreal 4. Uh, <clears throat> Unreal 3 uh, it definitely didn't use physically-based rendering, uh, but we had used Unreal 3 for over 10 years. Um, so this whole PBR workflow was a little bit new to us. Uh, but once we learned it, it streamlined how we made artwork. Uh, we were definitely able to make more detailed artwork. Uh, we actually had material reads and lighting this time. Um, obviously, uh, those, were, those things existed for Unreal 3, uh, but typically lights would just be washed out. It was difficult to, to have um, really, uh, really nice shadows. Um, overall, the amount of detail uh, in lighting improved quite a bit. Um, Material reads were also a pretty big step forward. Uh, again, on BL2, uh, textures were, we could only have, uh, we could basically only use diffuse textures. 
uh, which meant they had to carry, um, we crammed them with a lot more information. So we would typically fake lighting, uh, fake shading uh, only in that texture. We would try and fake material reads. Uh, we had to pretty much uh, get as much as we could out of just that single texture. Um, but now we're actually able to have roughness, metalness, uh, and have actual material reads. Um, additionally, shaders could be much more complex. Um, so they were actually, uh, we were able to have some pretty nice tools to push our art style uh, a bit further than before. This did come with some downsides though. Uh, as I said, PBR was a new thing to us. Uh, we weren't quite sure how to wield it. Um, with Borderlands being a stylized game, we weren't sure what a physically accurate rendering system would mean to us. Um, we had to do a lot to uh, push our tech from something that's true to life uh, to something that's a bit more stylized. Um, on BL2, we basically used a Sobel outline to draw lines around characters and objects. Um, we stuck with that, but we also tried a few things to push the style even further. Um, but in the end, we ended up cutting those things out. Um, additionally, the limitations of this engine were unknown. Uh, we definitely had a lot more to work with, but we weren't sure what would be expensive, what the engine would uh, have a hard time with, um, or basically where its limitations would be. Uh, so stuff like map size, draw distances, shader complexity, uh, the number of draw calls in a map or on screen, uh, triangle counts, and many other factors were a little bit no unknown uh, as to what the maximum amount could be. Uh, this also meant that um, with this new engine, uh, we had to rework a lot of our tools since they were built for Unreal 3. Uh, so the difference is, uh, in BL2, models were typically um, in the hundreds of triangles, uh, but for BL3, they could be in the thousands. I think the maximum mesh size was over 120,000. Um, in some cases, it was probably actually higher for, at least for environment assets, it was around 120,000. Um, we could definitely push a lot more on screen but triangle, our, our triangle budgets were more memory bound. Uh, texture size increased by about uh, roughly a factor of four, but we still had trouble streaming all of them. Um, maps were pretty large, so the extent, uh, uh, the amount of textures that we could have loaded uh, was still a bit limited. Um, as I said, shaders could be more complex. BL2, uh, they ranged from about 32 for your typical environment asset um, all the way up to about 140, uh, which I think uh, weapons were pretty high, about in that 140 count range. Uh, but on BL3, they could be, they would start at 100 and be over 500 instructions pretty easily. Um, performance. Uh, Again, improved, but there were many more variables and it became more difficult to um, performance profile things and understand exactly where uh, performance issues might be occurring. Uh, Multi-threading, uh, instead of, I believe PS2 was a dual core, uh, this time we had eight cores to work with. Um, but of course, we're also running a lot more stuff at the same time. Um, and in some cases, uh, the, doing the same fundamental operations were a bit more expensive. Uh, plus there's, uh, I think there was overhead from operating system and uh, UI and uh, many other things that uh, had to run in the background. Um, so let's talk about the style. Okay, so what exactly is it? Um, it's not quite cell shaded. Um, it's meant to mimic a comic book style. Um, 
uh, with hand-drawn line work. Um, we call this uh, line art inked or inking. Uh, so all of the lines that you see on uh, this example image here are actually hand-drawn. Um, this stuff isn't procedurally generated, and we take a lot of pride in this art style because it's something that so far cannot be done uh, by uh, a computer. Um, in addition to the uh, hand-drawn inks, we also stylize our textures. Uh, we typically run them through a few filters in Photoshop uh, to remove a bit of noise, uh, to um, kind of step colors a bit. And the goal of all of this is to make uh, our artwork visually appealing, not uh, and stylized, uh, but not noisy, busy, or filthy. Uh, and I think it's also worth mentioning that this is very ambitious considering um, how time consuming it is and how large the scope of BL3 was. Uh, almost any texture that uh, needed this, this hand painted ink treatment uh, would take possibly one to four days longer than a typical, uh, a typical texture would. So how do we execute this style? Or how do we make artwork for it? Um, stylization begins with a model. Um, in this example here, uh, you may recognize it as the quick change station. Um, you can see that they're not overly complex. Uh, there's not a lot of detail added uh, through sculpting. Um, typically, anything hard surface, the model remains pretty simple uh, because inks will cover a lot of the fine detail. Um, so we have to keep shapes large and readable uh, and make sure that their impact, uh, they can be seen from a distance. Um, we typically don't add much fine noise to normal maps. Um, that's excluded because roughness and metalness um, are better at, uh, are, are more um, vital to the material read. Uh, and we typically focus on the large to medium shapes. Um, the difficulty lies in balancing this composition without seeing final inks. So inking. This is an example uh, of the ink map that we use. Um, this map specifically uh, uh, is packed with uh, metalness and roughness, uh, and it removes uh, ink lines from lighting, so they stay pitch black. Um, So when creating artwork, uh, we start with the line work of major shapes and UV shells to, get, to make sure that inks are visible from a distance. So stuff like the door frame, stuff like this uh, inset panel here, uh, we typically do inks around that to make sure that the shape can still be seen from a distance. Smaller elements like wood grain, fasteners, panels, uh, are all inked to sell materials without material reads. So typically, uh, for example, if you are making a wooden log, uh, you would add inks so that it reads like wood, and it would not require a, a material read, or excuse me, um, it would not require color uh, textures or some kind of material to, uh, uh, to make it read as wood. Uh, after the main, uh, the major inks are done, we go through and add uh, highlights and shadows. Um, you can maybe see a little bit around the control panel here and around some of the major ink lines. Uh, this is kind of the only faked lighting we use. Um, some of the highlights still interact with lights. Um, if a light shines on them, they do get just a little bit brighter. Um, 
but this adds just a little bit of depth. Um, and actually, to make a little point of this, uh, so if you look at this model, um, especially in this lower portion here, uh, you can see that it's clean and there's no information there. But we, when we move on to inks, uh, the metal panels that have been added, uh, like they're just added line work. But you can still see just a little bit of depth because of the hand-painted highlight and shadow. Okay, so inking quality. Uh, as I said, this is a very time-consuming and tedious art style. Um, the way people execute their line work has a huge qual impact on quality. Um, ink lines need to f be confident and flow rather than be sketchy. Um, it takes a lot of practice to be good at this um, and years to excel in it. Um, so it's no small feat um, being trained up on this art style. Um, typically, the last step is texturing. Of course, this is where we add color and maybe a bit more detail. Uh, but during this phase, uh, inks still need to read well. Um, as you can see in this example, um, the line work is still very readable. Um, if textures weren't executed very well, the amount of noise, uh, the amount of information in them uh, would not harmonize with inks. Um, so it's all part of uh, this, <laughs> it's all part of understanding the style and uh, learning how to balance all the factors um, uh, in the composition of an asset. Uh, so to step back just a little bit, um, for uh, BL2, we typically used Photoshop uh, to do pretty much all of our texturing. Uh, but this time we used substance to do the heavy lifting. Um, we use it. We used it to get about 80% of the way there. Uh, 80, excuse me, 80% of the way to a finished asset, uh, and make sure that material reads were uh, consistent with others. Uh, make sure that things were in the correct value range. Uh, otherwise, it it was a huge help with consistency. We still use Photoshop, however. Uh, it got us about the last 20% of the way there. Uh, we used it for texture filtering. As I said, um, there is a filter that we use called TuneIt uh, that will simplify textures a bit and help push the style. Uh, a lot of people preferred it for inking because it has better brush control uh, than Substance Painter. And we use it for final adjustments to add uh, overlays and other details that we we're unable to include in a high poly model or add effectively with Substance Painter. Um, let's see. So uh, PBR was a tricky thing to adapt to uh, because once again, this is a stylized game. PBR is physically based. It's true to life, or it's supposed to be true to life. Uh, uh, but we had to make quite a few changes to make it work. Uh, so like I said before, the diffuse texture might be the only texture an asset would get. We would try to include all the information in that. Uh, and it was actually a little bit mind-blowing to now have an albedo map, which was just color, basically. Uh, in fact, when we first started, we treated them as diffuse textures and included, uh, used the entire value range uh, and added um, our hand-painted shadow uh, baked and ambient occlusion into it um, because that's what we did in the past game. Um, let's see. So, again, Substance helped us with this transition, um, but we weren't sure what exceptions applied to our style. Uh, but moving forward, this is how we authored our textures. So, uh, where the albedo was full color, uh, we used a material mask which contained uh, roughness, metalness, and an ink map. Um, this is what it looks like. Looks a bit funky, right? Um, because the ink mask was packed into the red channel. Uh, this is, of course, the flattened version of the uh, ink mask that was on the uh, previous slide. Here's the roughness map. 
here's the metal in this map. So when they all come together, there's a pretty huge difference. Um, obviously, the one on the left is from BL3. And unfortunately, I couldn't get a better screenshot, uh, but the one on the right is from BL2. Okay, let's talk leadership a little bit. Uh, and for a little bit more context, um, I was brought on to BL3 as the content art lead in late 2016. Uh, and maintain that title for uh, the rest of development. Um, so as a lead, you have a few core responsibilities. One of them is to protect your team from the mayhem that is development. Um, it's kind of like those insurance commercials, with that guy that represents mayhem. Well, you're the person that shields your team from that. Um, you, you are also there to provide team members with the support that they need to excel. Uh, and work with other departments to make an awesome game. Uh, leadership has its up and ups and downs and some trade-offs. Um, so weirdly, you're the shield, but also the whip. So as I said, you shield your team from chaos. Uh, so uh, in order to do that, sometimes you need to push back and, you, and negotiate to make sure that uh, your team isn't overloaded w with work, um, or things don't get too complex. Um, you need to stand up for your team and rep represent them uh, well, uh, too. Uh, there may be interdepartment meetings or presentations that must be done, uh, and you need to conduct yourself uh, in, a, in a nice way for those. Um, and be ready when things don't go as planned. Um, Sometimes uh, you can plan stuff out pretty well, but it will always, maybe not always, but it can go awry. Uh, so be prepared for that. <laughs> um, so at the, at the same time, um, where you might be shielding your team from uh, external forces, uh, you also need to uh, maintain some discipline within your own team. So that's when you got to get out, get out the whip and <laughs> make sure people are pulling their weight. Um, it took a while for me to understand this. Uh, well, this whole thing was a learning process for me. Uh, but you are the boss and act like the leadership you wish you had when you started. Um, so in some ways, it means being absolutely professional. Um, and not, I don't know, gossiping about things. Um, it also means that you need to be a per people person and understand uh, what people uh, are working towards, um, what they respond to, and what motivates them. Um, so learn how to talk to, uh, learn how to talk, uh, learn how you need to talk to people um, based on their needs. Uh, and then, of course, make sure everyone is pulling their weight. Um, if there's someone that isn't, uh, isn't quite pulling their weight, um, it's kind of unfair to the rest of the team to, uh, to let that stuff slide. OK, so you're also the glue and the WD-40, which basically means you hold your team together, uh, but you also have to keep things moving. Uh, so as, as I said, um, Bad apples, underperformers, poor attitudes can undermine progress. Um, that's also where shielding your team from the mayhem of development is important. Um, uh, yeah. You also need to help people uh, help each other so that everyone can improve. Um, so it's not just about you trying to train everyone or picking a specific person to try and train someone or help someone along. It's about making your team work together to achieve common goals. Uh, you also need to understand that um, you may not always be able to uh, reach a resolution on every uh, situation. There's going to be times that you have to compromise. 
Um, so deal with situations as best you can, uh, but no, it won't be perfect. Uh, so here's the WD-40 part, keep it running smoothly. So make sacrifices to keep your team, or excuse me, so your team can keep things running smoothly. Uh, as an artist, uh, I would like to make artwork, but that's not always a priority. So you have to put your team first and make sure that they have what they need, even if it means sacrificing uh, your time to do artwork or things that you wanna do. Uh, in those situations, a lot of the time, producers and art directors are there to help, so keep them involved. Um, they will offer, provide advice and solutions that can pave the way forward. Uh, then lastly, set up some kind of cadence uh, to, keep things, uh, to keep things moving at some kind of beat. Uh, have regular meetings, uh, do regular stand-ups, um, do stuff so, uh, schedule stuff so that things stay on track and there's a regular, uh, and there's regular deadlines. Your time is valuable but worthless. Um, so kind of as I said before, don't waste your time making art when you can do something that benefits the team. Um, you may spend all day giving feedback and talking to people. Um, that's totally okay. It feels like uh, you're not really accomplishing anything yourself, uh, but the conversations you have uh, may save, the, the five minutes you spend uh, may save people hours of time. And it can also lead to something longer term that, that will save even more time. Uh, things will also change to invalidate your work. Uh, you can have carefully laid plans and schedules to make sure that things stay on track. Um, but there's always going to be the curveball uh, where someone requested work late, uh, someone above you wants a change uh, to something that's being worked on. Um, there will typically be stuff like that that you need to prepare for. Uh, so make sure that there's some time set aside to address uh, potential unknowns. Uh, don't, do, don't get too clever. Uh, this is definitely something I struggled with. Uh, in the, and you have to keep in mind what is best for the game and your team uh, and the production of that game. Uh, because if something is too complicated, uh, it may ultimately not work out. Um, so always aim for the best bang for your buck, something that will have the greatest impact in the least amount of time. Uh, and this is also the most difficult. There's two most difficult things. Uh, so your effectiveness is based on the prosperity of your team and not your ideas or artistic ability. Um, go, uh, coming from being an artist, it's kind of difficult to bring that up. Uh, not working on artwork might mean that you're getting, you can get rusty, your skills might be uh, getting worse, um, but as a lead, it's not about that. Uh, it means that you may have to be a champion for ideas other than your own. It also means that you're probably gonna make a ton of mistakes, um, learn from them and move on. If you're not making mistakes, you're not learning stuff, and that's incredibly true. And also avoid the sunk cost fallacy. If something isn't working, change it rather than doubling down on it. Um, it's really easy to look at something uh, and say that, oh, it's been weeks, uh, it's taken weeks to get this working. And then to find out that there's something better, uh, don't continue with the thing that doesn't work. Change it. Okay, so thank you for listening to me talk about BL3. Um, we'll talk about landing a job at this point. Okay, so what do we look for in a content artist? Someone that shows potential. Uh, this could mean a junior with room to grow. Could also mean uh, a senior that has skill and experience and high quality, uh, but they also may be kind of at the end of their uh, talent potential. 
so those two possibilities kind of average out in some ways. Um, we also look for people with passion and creativity. Uh, like we need to, we need to see that you really want this job. Um, there's definitely a lot of people that apply. Uh, we need to, we need to see what makes you stand out. Uh, we are also looking for specialists, not generalists. We'd rather have people that excel in a couple ways rather than uh, do, rather than people that do okay in just a few, or excuse me, that do okay in, in many ways. We also look for solid portfolios. Uh, use ArtStation for that. Uh, we've seen people submit portfolios through like Pinterest and Instagram, and that's just not a good idea. Uh, you can host it, uh, you can pay for hosting, um, but I just recommend using ArtStation because I think there are greater chances for exposure through that. Uh, and specific to content art, we are looking for high quality props and small environments. Uh, so the high quality prop and small environment thing, that basically means um, a few examples of individual pieces uh, that can show uh, aptitude at, at a single idea. So, um, I don't know, for example, this podium, if that's executed well, that's a good prop. Uh, but we also want to see an environment that shows a bit of skill in larger compositions. Um, so doing like this entire stage with lighting, uh, that would be a decent small environment that shows uh, a, a little bit of aptitude in something that's more complex. Uh, we also look for a balance of quality and technical aspects. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are always bound by certain constraints. Knowing what those are and how to push boundaries within them uh, are important for selling. Um, to show a balance of quality and technical stuff, uh, it's good to show wire frames or texture breakdowns, uh, uh, U, um, UV layouts and stuff like that. Uh, because we need to see that you can make quality artwork, but also make it as inexpensive as possible. Basically, detailed but efficient. Uh, and optimized texture use. Um, to elaborate on those just a little bit more, uh, for example, if this podium is like 10,000 triangles, it better be super awesome looking. But if it looks the same and it's only made out of 2,000 triangles, we're going to go with the person that made it the, uh, with the lowest triangle count. Uh, and for optimized texture use, uh, we typically look for UV layouts where uh, UV shells are overlapped, um, things are mirrored. Uh, and a few other techniques to see how people maybe save a bit of space and reduce texture size. So definitely focus on quality instead of quantity. Uh, that means excluding work that can be used against you. Uh, so if you're going for uh, a content artist position, for example, uh, include your props, but don't include like drawings or photography or characters or anything that's going to drag your portfolio down. And if you only have one piece, show it off very well. Uh, do breakdowns, um, uh, do your UV layouts, texture sheets, like put it in a small scene, light it, uh, show it off as best you can. To build your portfolio, uh, as I kind of said, um, stick to what you're good at. Uh, but also if you are, excuse me, uh, if you are focusing on one thing uh, or one step of a process, uh, for example, maybe textures, uh, do more to show that off uh, than models. Um, also subject matter is less important than execution. Uh, so you could pick a boring thing like this but if you model and texture it really well and then put it in a little scene and light it, light it well, 
uh, that's much better than having like a really cool, complicated thing that's not done very well. Um, pick something that's familiar but stands out. Um, so let's say you want to do a sci-fi hallway. Um, it's something that a lot of people do. Uh, we typically see a lot in portfolios we receive. Uh, but do something to make it stand out. Um, think outside of the box a little bit. Um, for example, instead of a sci-fi corridor, maybe it's a sci-fi atrium or something. Uh, but do something that is a little bit new, uncommon, or interesting. Uh, also be sure to keep it attainable. Uh, if you bite off more than you can chew, you're less likely to complete it and you don't want incomplete work on your portfolio. Uh, and set yourself apart. I kind of already talked about that a little bit. Uh, OK, so resumes. Um, save them in PDF. Make sure that they're easily accessible. Uh, if you save them in PDF, it means that formatting won't get messed up uh, compared to like a Word document or something. Uh, they're definitely secondary to your portfolio. We would rather see an awesome portfolio than uh, a really awesome resume. Uh, in fact, uh, typically a resume is sort of used to cross-check your, your quality bar with your experience. Um, if you're a senior artist and your work is, is okay, uh, your resume will verify uh, how much experience you have, uh, and we can we can kind of formulate an opinion as to um, if your portfolio quality bar uh, matches your experience. Uh, so yeah, um, when you're making a resume, keep it short and simple and to the point. Uh, we don't need to know about. <laughs> your, or, sorry, excuse me. Um, also, don't add weird graphics or fonts or sketches or drawing or drawings or headshots um, because we don't really care about that stuff in a resume. Um, it's a resume is just for your qualifications and experience. Um, don't be creative with them. Uh, yeah, and basically show your education and work experience as quick as possible. Uh, don't add any extra fluff. Also, yeah, don't add your, your hobbies. Um, they may be relevant to the job, uh, but typically we'll ask about that in, in interviews. Um, so including that in your resume is mm, maybe not the best thing. Also, uh, I should add, if your resume is super short and it is just a few years of education or part-time work, um, that's all you need. Uh, you don't have to try and pad it with uh, high school education or other education. Uh, just keep it simple and short and relevant to uh, the job you're applying for. Okay, so if you have a portfolio and a resume, uh, you need to put yourself out there. Uh, so post your work on forums, post it on ArtStation, um, Post it on, on any place that might get attention, even Instagram and that stuff. Uh, just don't refer to that as your portfolio. Uh, reach out to people. Uh, reach out to people on LinkedIn if you can uh, track down uh, an email address or track down an industry professional. Feel free to contact them. They may not respond, but uh, it's still something that that could give you a leg up. Um, uh, once you post your work and reach out to people, uh, also, I apologize, I apologize, I skipped a step. Uh, when you're posting your work, ask for feedback. Uh, follow through with that feedback as well. Uh, and ultimately, when you've done your reaching out uh, and talking to people, be sure to follow up. Uh, Maybe they haven't responded because they're busy and they just need that extra little like, hey, I'm here, reminder. Uh, so be sure to follow up. Uh, if there was feedback that needed to be addressed uh, in, the, uh, in the meantime, be sure to uh, have the results for that. 
Uh, and then lastly, uh, keep at it and be persistent. Um, there's a lot of companies out there. Uh, it will take, it could take a lot of time to land a job, um, but be persistent and keep at it. And if you show uh, your passion and continue to improve uh, and take feedback well, uh, you will land a job. That's it. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, my name is Eric, and I'm kind of a leadership enthusiast. And Hi. I have uh, learned, if you're like me, then you've learned something from horrible bosses the same way you've learned from good bosses. What's something you've learned from a bad boss experience that you're like, I'm not going to do that? And what's something you've learned from a fantastic boss? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so something I learned from a good boss and something I learned from a bad boss. Um, OK, so something I learned from a bad boss. <laughs> uh, sounds like I'm playing a video game. Um, I think the first thing is to not, <laughs> not to uh, ignore people that are trying to get your attention. Um, people are typically looking for uh, direction or approval of or something to continue working to keep moving forward, uh, and and ignoring them is <laughs> seems like a pretty common sense thing not to do. Okay, and something. Uh, I learned from a good boss is uh, to have patience. Um, that mayhem of development is definitely real. Uh, and the more level-headed you can be, um, the easy it'll, easier it will be to uh, uh, work with your team and other people. Next. <laughs> Hey there. Um, I just had a quick question about um, as a new graduate and as like a um, starting off artist going to a um, studio, how hard was it for you to adapt and to keep up with your new team members that had already been at the company before you? And um, yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, so starting in 2009, uh, well, 2010 when I was hired, um, the art team was pretty small. Uh, and there was a variety of talent there. Um, so at first, to be honest, it was a little bit unclear uh, if I was keeping up or not. Um, because also that thing of having uh, experienced people that do okay work uh, is definitely a thing. Um, so like understanding uh, the quality bars you're hitting, uh, that's actually kind of up to a, a lead or mentor to explain. Um, yeah, <laughs> next question, <laughs> sorry. Hi. So Hello. Sort of a two-part question. Um, one is, do you guys actually have like time for dailies and do you break those down into sweat boxes and what I guess how fast is like a turnaround for that? Like, do you implement, or what do you take away from it? So, um, so I actually don't quite know what those things are. You turn in, say you, you meet up after the day, you turn it in, kind of see where everybody's at, and then do you sweat box that where you kind of bring everyone together and have them, okay, you're working on this character, and or I guess environment piece, this is what we want to see more of next time. Hmm. Do you do that? Basically what our, our feedback loop and cadence is. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So uh, quite frankly, uh, for BL3, it was, it was sort of all over the place um, to start with, but we fell into a decent rhythm of doing uh, daily stand-ups. And eventually, um, uh, and, and then also every Friday we would do a content art review where the entire team would look at uh, 
any artwork that was that was ready or uh, relevant to a milestone um, or otherwise discuss uh, maybe where uh, maps or other um, relevant things were at. Uh, and then eventually we started doing uh, slightly more specific reviews, like instead of looking at everything, we would look at just props uh, and just architecture. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's pretty close. Right. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wanting to ask, like, so you guys have a specific art style that you're supposed to achieve, and you have a whole team that has never done, like, this kind of art style before. What is the training like, being able to get everyone up to the same kind of level of art style and make sure that everyone makes a clean kind of uh, assets for the game and stuff like that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that, was also, uh, that was also a thing that took a little bit of time to figure out. Uh, but let's see, to speak to that specifically, um, over the course of development, our team ranged from uh, 10 to 18 people with about five or six being senior artists, like they had worked on previous games, they had around 10 years experience. Um, and as our team grew, uh, we took on probably about five, uh, seven, eight junior-ish artists. Uh, so eventually we ended up kind of pairing them together. Um, but a lot of people had, had a real drive to learn the style uh, and make some really awesome stuff. Um, they were like keen on working on, on, you know, something that's not like real life props. Uh, so a lot of them um, kind of took it upon themselves to work with senior artists. Uh, learn the style. We have one artist in particular, um, Robert Santiago, that has like 15 years experience at Gearbox uh, and is and used to actually do illustration for comic books. Um, so we kind of refer to him on quite a few things with the style. Um, that's pretty much how we do it. It wasn't a super structured thing. Um, but it was basically to pair up junior and senior artists. So do you guys yep. look for more juniors in that way? That way they can pick up on the stylized uh, kind of versions faster than say seniors because they're like more stuck in their ways or um, yeah, like that? Um, a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of uh, factors that go into deciding who we hire. Um, one, of them, one of them is budget, for example. Another is possibly time. Um, when developing a game this huge uh, with a, TD, uh, a time consuming art style like this, uh, sometimes you need to find talent quickly. Uh, so we did go for, uh, we did kind of go for hiring a few junior artists because uh, there are some pretty talented people with not a lot of experience. And that does mean that they're maybe a little, a little more malleable to uh, our studio and our style. Uh, but we also picked up a few mid-level people that um, had a lot of experience and more broad talents uh, that also did a great job of picking up the style and working with others to learn it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my Hello. name is Wade, and I was curious when you're working to uh, break into that first industry job as an artist, how do you set yourself above or apart from uh, in the interview process, or how have you seen it hmm. done? Um, it's a good question. Um, so uh, let's actually start with the portfolio, um, because I think that's the thing that gets, uh, that's like your, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Catch line, it's the thing that gets our attention. Um, so the people that we have recently uh, hired, they typically had a few very well done props um, that kind of showed a variety of skills. Uh, they typically had a mix of like hard surface or, and organic elements. Um, and then they also presented them really well uh, because like your portfolio, I should have said this in the presentation, but your portfolio also shows off your artistic eye. Um, 
So if you if you excel at like modeling and texturing, but then just like throw it over here and don't light it, it's kind of like mm -hmm. it could have been cool. Um, so you can do some stuff to like present your work really well, uh, and that's going to be the thing that that like puts you in the like okay, let's look at them closer pile. Um, then after that, uh, in phone interviews. Uh, we typically uh, we typically go over like uh, your work history, your education, um, uh, just kind of the standard stuff. Uh, also, like why do you want to work at Gearbox, things like that. Um, the thing that would set yourself apart in an interview is um, uh, let's see, probably if you. If you pick your favorite work uh, and explain it well, uh, like explain why you did it, uh, what it meant to you, um, stuff like that. Uh, and then if you, actually if you follow through with any feedback that we give you uh, and update your portfolio with that, that's actually a huge, uh, a huge plus. Uh, because that shows that not only are you uh, ambitious and maybe want to specifically work at Gearbox, uh, it also shows that you can follow through with feedback uh, and you take the time to, to do things right. Hi, my name is Christian, and I just wanted to find out how important it is to cater to the company in terms of portfolio to the company that you're applying to. Ah, um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think it is, I would approach it as having a broad portfolio at first. Uh, so I would pick my best work and make sure you have about four, five-ish pieces uh, that are really good. I mean, if you have less, that's fine too. Uh, but use that to apply to anywhere uh, because I don't think you want to um, like you don't want to pass up opportunities that you might otherwise get by applying to other places um, but if you are particularly passionate about uh, working for Gearbox or like id software or something like that uh, I think it's acceptable to do something more towards their style but I wouldn't um, like make that carry your portfolio if that makes sense Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Give it up for Jacob. Awesome. And I know you guys have a lot of questions. For our 3.30 panel, we're going to be here with all the six graduates, and it's going to be all about you guys. So it's going to be a, a conversation the entire time. So anyone who had questions, if you can stay for the 3.30, that would be awesome. And these guys are more than happy to answer all those questions. Let's give it up one more time. Hopefully, you'll stay for 3.30. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.